Now you're welcome back. So we wanted to mark a 10-year anniversary uh, on the show this evening and really to tease out the ramifications 10 years on. So it was the 12th of September to be exact, 2012. Uh, Wednesday, David Cameron is the Prime Minister and he stood before the Commons and said the following. Mr Speaker, with the weight of the new evidence in this report, it is right for me today as Prime Minister to make a proper apology to the families of the 96 for all they have suffered over the past 23 years. Indeed, the new evidence that we're presented with today makes clear, in my view, that these families have suffered a double injustice. The injustice of the appalling events, the failure of the state to protect their loved ones, and the indefensible wait to get to the truth, and then the injustice of the denigration of the deceased, that they were somehow at fault for their own deaths. So on behalf of the government, and indeed our country, I am profoundly sorry that this double injustice has been left uncorrected for so long. <laughs> Mr Speaker, because of what I've described as the second injustice, the false version of events, not enough people in this country understand what the people of Merseyside have been through. This appalling death toll of so many loved ones lost was compounded by an attempt to blame the victims. A narrative about hooliganism on that day was created which led many in the country to accept that somehow it was a grey area. Today's report is black and white. The Liverpool fans were not the cause of the disaster. The panel has quite simply found no evidence in support of allegations of exceptional level, levels of drunkenness, ticketlessness or violence amongst Liverpool fans. No evidence that fans had conspired to arrive late at the stadium. And no evidence that they stole from the dead and the dying. Mr Speaker, I'm sure the whole House will want to thank the Bishop of Liverpool and his panel for all the work they've done. And I'm sure that all sides will join with me in paying tribute to the incredible strength and dignity of the Hillsborough families and, and the community which has backed them in their long search for justice. While nothing can ever bring back those that were lost, with all the documents revealed, nothing held back, the families at last have access to the truth. And I commend this statement to the House. Yeah. So there you are. That was Prime Minister Cameron, 2012. An apology like that, not an everyday occurrence in the Commons. Very clear cut, very emphatic. And uh, the report he was uh, talking about had been three years in the making. It had uh, commenced in 2009, culminated in 2012. And that apology was forthcoming. So uh, lots of MPs that day uh, called for legal action. And the Home Secretary, Theresa May, ordered a criminal inquiry into the disaster, Operation Resolve, which we'll uh, touch on in due course. But 10 years on, where are we, is the question we thought we would ask. And we're joined by two men who were at Hillsborough in 1989. Tony Evans uh, writes for The Independent and is a regular guest on the show. Tony, thanks for your time. Uh, it's a pleasure. And Richie Greaves is with us as well, who was also there and has worked with the Hillsborough Survivors Association. Richie, you're very welcome to the show. Thank you. I presume, Richie, you two know each other down the years and have had many, many, many conversations into late into the night about this um, uh, situation. Yeah, Tony and I are friends, yeah. yeah. So, ten years on from the Cameron apology, it sounds very fulsome and uh, Richie seems to say, I suspect that the things that you so desperately wanted a Prime Minister uh, to say, and I presume it held the promise of big action ahead, what were your emotions, can you remember, 10 years ago? Um, I remember it crystal clear. Um, I, was on a, I was on a job and um, the, the, one of the managers from a firm I was working for had just jumped in the van with me uh, and I asked him if I could keep the radio on because uh, the Hillsborough News was just breaking. Uh, and we'd been eagerly waiting, if, wait, uh, waiting it for weeks. Um, and when Cameron come on and I mean we thought we, we never thought we'd hear a double apology off a Tory Prime Minister and when he come out with that I just broke down um, it, I don't think we realised the, the weight that we were carrying on our shoulders you know to walk around for 23 years uh, basically I mean I, I, I said in my evidence in Warrington in 2015 mm. or sorry 2014 that for 23 years of my life, I'd been painted as a drunken ticketless murderer. Um, and that was the day that that weight lifted off our shoulders. You know, to, uh, that was the day the truth 
finally got out, and that, that's what that day is called, the 12th of September. Uh, it's a family, bereaved families and survivors is known as Truth Day. Tony, can you remember your thoughts on the day? Well, I, I was trying to be dispassionate. I've been uh, told a couple of days before that the um, that it, it was going to come out our way and the it would be a very positive, um, that the whole day would be a very positive day for us. And even though, you know, since you're waiting, we've had so many disappointments, all of a sudden, territory prime minister say this was unbelievable. And I was in shock and I did a, I was doing the rounds of the media that day. Uh, it was my day off at work, but I, I spent all day, you know, sort of saying, you know, this is at last, you know, we're at last people are hearing the reality of the situation. At last, the establishment have accepted it. And lots of people got in touch with me, people who worked in newspapers, people in senior positions, and apologised to me and said, oh, my God, all these years, we've thought what the sun said was right. We thought the worst of you. You know, and like, I'm, I'm so ashamed. And and that was, it was, it was moving. It was, uh, and to think that we're in the situation we are now, a decade on, when everything's worse than ever, and all that, all that truth, all that reality seems to have evaporated because so many people, uh, so many people have backslid it's, the, the abuse, the trolling, and the Hillsborough denial is worse, in my belief, than it ever has been, even in the immediate, even in the immediate two, three years after the disaster. Just to. Um... I suppose remind. I know you two were intimately aware of the last decade, and it's been uh, an extraordinary one in many ways, and an, an eventful one. Uh, just to re- to remind uh, the listeners of, of where we are. So uh, that inquest that was promised that day that started on twenty fourteen, in twenty fourteen, and uh, became the longest case in British legal history. So I presume, Richie, that's the one you contributed to that you mentioned there, and uh, the verdict came in in twenty sixteen. There were fourteen questions to be answered. Uh, the key finding from that two-year expedition was that uh, the 96, and I know it's now 97, but the 96 were unlawfully killed. And so that overturned the verdict of accidental death, which was put forward at the original inquest. And I, I remember that evening, I'm sure you do as well. Uh, the Home Secretary, uh, Theresa May, spoke after that inquest. We'll just have a listen. Clearly. The jury's determination that those who died were unlawfully killed is of great public importance. It overturns, in the starkest way possible, the verdict of accidental deaths returned at the original inquests. However, the jury's findings do not, of course, amount to a finding of criminal liability, and no one should impute criminal liability to anyone while the ongoing investigations are still pending. Mr Speaker, while the inquests have concluded, this is not the end of the process. The decision about whether any criminal prosecution or prosecutions can be brought forward will be made by the Crown Prosecution Service on the basis of evidence gathered as part of the two ongoing investigations. That decision is not constrained in any way by the jury's conclusions. The House will understand that I cannot comment in detail on matters that may lead to a criminal investigation. I can, however, say that the offences under investigation include gross negligence manslaughter, misconduct in public office, perverting the course of justice and perjury, as well as offences under the Safety of Sports Grounds Act 1975 and the Health and Safety at Work Act 1974. So that was Theresa May and that's in 2016. So I I presume, Tony on the back of Cameron's apology, on the back of this two-year-long inquest and then Theresa May talking that day about um, potential criminal proceedings, there must have been a great sense of momentum uh, amongst uh, Liverpool people. Yeah, there was. Uh, what, what's interesting is that David Cameron actually understood, you know, sort of where it got gone on. He got it. I mean, he'd lost a child himself and he was particularly moved by the, the young people who died at Hillsborough. And Theresa May also got it. One of, uh, uh, one of the, you know, sort of the most uh, significant Hillsborough campaigners had her personal mobile number. You know, she understood there was a huge political will at the time, there was political momentum. And we thought, because of that, we would see justice and we would see the guilty parties in court and we would see them tried. And at least, we didn't expect anyone to go to jail. Uh, at least I didn't. 
Well, we expect them to take responsibility for their actions. I mean, all these, a lot of these people were extremely well-paid public servants, and they had, you know, the benefit from the honours system. And then we thought, well, at least we'll see the reputations trashed. We'll see them having to take responsibility for letting down not just football fans, not just us, but the British public. Because any time you go to a, a, a civic event, a public event, you need to be sure that the, uh, the, the you know the, the authorities uh, have set up to protect you, and if it all goes wrong, they'll look into it. But instead, suddenly we got Boris Johnson, who famously was editor of the Spectator, where uh, in two thousand five, when they repeated the um, the Hillsborough Slayers under his editorship, uh, and, and and the political will disappeared. And we saw the trials, which turned into fiascos. But I think the other thing, Joe, is because after the inquest, we were told, don't talk about this in public. Don't, you know, it might prejudice the criminal trials. So we kept silence. And we, we did what we were supposed to do as, as honest, decent citizens. And you know what? That left the ground for the deniers, the liars, and the dissemblers. And because we kept quiet, a new narrative grew up amongst people, I believe, and we 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 lost we lost the moral authority. We lost the, the high moral grounds, and a new generation come up who were ready to believe all the lies as as published by the Sun, as you know, as as presented to the public by Mackenzie, and it left us in a situation that when the the criminal trials. Uh, collapsed and the, the the will ran away ran out in the investigations we were left without justice and all the promise of 10 years ago and all the promise after the inquests they were gone forever and that that's you know a decade on i look back at that with extreme bitterness mm. Uh, David Duckenfield is obviously a name synonymous with Hillsborough. So in 2017, he was charged, and it was on a charge that Theresa May alluded to, uh, manslaughter by gross negligence. And it took two years for that trial to happen. That happened in 2019 at Preston Crown Court at this stage. Duckenfield's 75 years of age. Initially, jury couldn't find a verdict. There was a retrial, went on for six weeks. And in November of 19, he was found not guilty. And then in 2021, Donald Denton and Alan Foster from South Yorkshire Police, they were charged with, uh, in effect, altering police statements and they were acquitted. Um, so, Richie, your thoughts on... on I, I presume you share uh, Tony's, um, I suppose, sense of momentum after that inquest which you partook in and then looked on with great interest into the criminal proceedings. Yeah, 100%. Uh, I mean, once we got the unlawful killing verdicts, you just thought that momentum would then carry us on and, we, and we'd see. I expected, you know, for years I've been saying if everyone that committed the criminal act at uh, Hillsborough on the 15th of April, 89, was to be jailed, they'd have to, they'd have to start building new jails. I mean, when the I, I went to Par Hall in Warrington for the, uh, when they announced how many were going to be prosecuted. Um and I was thinking it'd be hundreds, uh, but I think that the what the Crown Prosecution said was that they were going to go for the controlling minds, in other words, just the very senior uh, people involved. So that allowed basically hundreds of police officers who who'd committed criminal acts off the hook. Uh, they, they were away scot-free. Uh, only six people were, were um, named for prosecution. Um, one of them, the charges against uh, Norman Betterson were f so flimsy, we knew immediately that, that, that they'd collapse. Mm. So only five people were prosecuted, only one police officer for wrongdoing on the day, and that was Duckenfield. Um, the, when it came to his trial, the Crown Prosecution Service put up um, a health and safety expert as, as the prosecutor instead of somebody who was an expert in uh, prosecuting people for criminal manslaughter. Um, so I, I just don't think there was any will from them to get a result. We, we thought the Crown Prosecution Service had an open goal. Um, you know, we, we, it was just a matter of finding him guilty. Um, in Warrington, Duckenfield had admitted that his failings um, caused the deaths of 96 people. He, he actually admitted that. But mm. then when it went to the criminal trial, he said that he was too ill, his memory had gone, 
uh, blah, blah, blah. And he just sat there like a dummy and wouldn't speak. Uh, and what he'd said in Warrington couldn't be reported at, at the criminal trial. So it, it was just a farce. And as Tony says, the political will had gone. Um, and I think there was then a political will to keep a lip on Hillsborough. I always said, that, like, in 2009, the cat got out the bag and and for a while we ran with that momentum. Um, but the minute they got it, the, after, the, after the inquest verdicts of unlawful killing, it was handed back into the government's hands for the criminal prosecutions. And once it was back in their hands, I think they wanted that cat back in the bag. They wanted to keep, keep a lid on it. Tony, to what extent when the inquest, that two-year inquest, when that came up with uh, the 96 were unlawfully killed, uh, did you anticipate successful criminal findings? I think you, you said you weren't expecting people to go to jail. So what were you expecting from those criminal proceedings? And, and would you have liked to see more people put on trial? Oh, without a doubt, without a doubt. I mean, I think under Theresa May, I think there was a strong will to see more people on trial. I think she was pushing them forward and she wanted to see some convictions. And essentially, well, I want to, I mean, Jochen Field, you know, he's an old man in the 70s. I didn't imagine him going to jail, but I would have liked the whole world to see his shame so that every time in the future that people mention David Jochen Field, he's the very essence of what the, the British refer to as a bad copper. You know, someone who, who not only got his job drastically wrong on the day. And we can all accept people get it wrong, even if it has fatal consequences, but who moved immediately to lie about it and wriggle off the hook, and then a conspiracy started around him. You know what? No one, no one can think it's a good thing in Britain. And lots of people say, oh, I support the police, and they instinctively support the police. But no one can think it's a good thing that the police cover up their own mistakes, that the police throw the blame. So I would like to have seen that exposed. But you know what? It's even more than that, Joe. Here we are, after Hillsborough, there was an absolute meltdown of the emergency services. You know, there was 40 ambulances queuing outside and never got on the pitch. People were pulling advertising hordings to put, you know, fans were putting fellow fans on them and taking them out to... Right? And we all know that. Fast forward to 2017. Fast forward to the Manchester Arena bombing and the same situations happened. There's queues of ambulance, can't get to the victims. They're carrying them out on advertising hordings. At least two of the victims died by, because of the same systemic errors that happened at Hillsborough. This is not about us. This is not about football. This is not about Scousers. This is not about Liverpool. This is not about Liverpool fans. What it is about is public safety. And we haven't learned the lessons of Hillsborough. We haven't learned the lessons of, um, of, of for the emergency services point of view. And we haven't learned the lessons of holding the authorities to account when they fail catastrophically. And you know what? We will meet the likes of myself and Richie will bang on about this until we go to our graves. Not for us. You know, the ship sailed for us. We're not going to get justice. The families are not going to get justice. There is no restitution. But we want to make sure that people in the future don't have to go through what we went, don't have to suffer what we did, don't have to experience what Richie did in the pens. That's what we're fighting for, and that's why we're here tonight, and that's why we will continue to talk about it. For any younger listeners who maybe haven't um, read up on this or watched the, some of the documentaries, uh, for instance, what Tony's alluding to there with uh, Duckenfield, he made the decision to open the gates. There were fans outside who couldn't get in and he opened the gates thinking to alleviate the build-up of fans and that led to the crush. So that was that was gross incompetency. But secondly, as you've talked about Tony, he lied very, very quickly and he's, he's admitted as much. He lied and he claims, well, the fans broke those gates. I didn't open them. Those gates were broken. And I think in your writing previously, Tony, you've described that as the founding myth of Hillsborough. And that lie was told at 3.15 and by 3.25, John Motson on the BBC was telling the world this. So there is, um, Richie, I suppose, the anger I'm sure you feel and the regret at the incompetency and then there's... Well, I don't know what adjective to use about the cover-up. That's a whole different ballpark. That the, the time in there at three fifteen is, is is horrific, really, isn't it? Because people were still dying in the pens at, at three fifteen. People were the fans were mounting a rescue effort. Uh, people were being dragged up into the west stand behind. Uh, it was all still going on, 
But Duckenfield had already scuttled off to the um, Sheffield Wednesday boardroom and was briefing the press to save his own skin. And what, one of the big things as well is um, the, there was a Liverpool, um, sec, the Liverpool secretary and club steward were on the pitch at the time and were being told by fans that, you know, um, that what the police were saying about breaking down the gate wasn't true. So they went and investigated and found out that, you know, Duckenfield was lying, there was no damage to the gate. But that lie by South Yorkshire Police wasn't corrected until Peter Wright, who was the chief constable at the time, went on national TV at half seven. So they let, they let that initial lie circulate around the world for four hours. You know, and, and in that time, you had, like, I think the president of UEFA called us animals and, um, you know, the, the, the story was already being established. And even though they had to um, they had to rein back in on, on that particular lie, you can be sure if they hadn't have found out, we'd still be fighting that lie now. That would be another one of the lies with, that goes along with the ticketless fans, with the drunken fans, with the, you know, that we robbed from the dead nonsense. Um, Richie, I'll, I wanted to ask you a question and I'll, I'll, I will come back to Tony's point about the um, maybe the, the vacuum of late and, and, and people choosing to believe all the old tropes about what happened that day, which is an interesting development. But when we talk about justice, uh, Richie, uh, is that for you about seeing certain people go to jail? Is it, is it just about them admitting wrongdoing? Because in, in some ways, people might look in from afar and say, you know, Liverpool fans have been so vindicated by the apology and by the inquest that, in a sense, that 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 side of justice has been fulfilled. So, what what more would you like to happen, or what what are the issues that really bug survivors and the families of of, of survivors and those who didn't make it out? Uh, well, I gave evidence in Sheffield in ninety one, um, and that was an absolute that was a circus. That was an absolute farce. What went on there? And they came up with an accidental uh, death verdict. Yeah. And what drove me on to keep being involved and to to give evidence and to campaign was a l- lots of the families wouldn't pick up the death certificate for their loved ones because it had accidental death on it. So I wanted to do anything I could possibly do to to try to help them in some small way if I could keep if I could keep being a voice, if I could give evidence again, that type of thing, I would do it until my, my dying day. Mm. Um, I, I don't think I ever... I was never hell-bent on, you know, people going to jail. But they should have been found guilty, especially in Warrington when Duckenfield admits that his failings led directly to the deaths of 96 people. How can, you, how can an inquest rule that... 96 people died because of the gross negligence manslaughter of David Duckenfield. And then he goes to a criminal trial and he walks away scot-free. Mm. Like the, the whole the British judicial system is broken and 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 we're mocked, we're mocked for it now. You know, for through no fault of our own. You know, we've we've fought all this time and and, and we have abuse thrown at us every single day day every week when teams turn up at Anfield they sing about hills but the sun was right you murderers and always the victims and all. it's not that we're victims what it, it, you know the lies that were told about us was so grotesque what are you supposed to do just like take it on the chin and say oh, don't don't worry about it if you've got any if you've got anything about you you're going to fight back aren't you and that's what we've done mm. on that death certificate point uh, I'm sure it was uh, incredibly poignant and, and noted that when Andrew Devine passed away in 2021 aged 55 he had life changing injuries from uh, Hillsborough and the coroner ruled that as unlawfully killed which is um, I'm sure uh, something that registered uh, in particular with all, everybody in Liverpool uh, Tony for you in 2022 into the next two, three, four, five years what is justice for the 97? What is justice? Well, there's no justice. We, we, as I say, we've come to terms with that. Right. There will be no justice. We can't do it. We, we, all we can do is make sure that people know the truth and make sure that history looks back and will, judges the British judiciary, the British police and the British government in this period uh, with, with absolute disdain. We need to make sure that the, the the narrative, which is already overwhelming us in some ways, you know, the 
the, the, the families of, of the, the dead of Hillsborough are getting trolled relentlessly on, 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 on social media. We need to, to try and stop that everywhere we can. We need to make sure that the falsehoods of 1989 don't become the established truths of the of the 20s, you know, the 2020s yeah. and the 2030s. And and going Tony, forward. sorry, sorry to interrupt, but just uh, I thought so. I don't want to minimise that for a second because I mean, geez, it's just it's hard to believe. My sense of those idiots on Twitter is that they know the truth and they're willfully repeating the lies, but everybody those included know that they are lies. I, like, I, I don't think anybody has to be convinced of what happened anymore. I, I don't think so. I think there's a new generation who, 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 because of our silence, waiting for the trials, because we could say nothing for fear of prejudice in the trials, I think there's a new generation who've learned the worst sort of uh, lies from the, the, the more bigoted types, you know, the sort of, and, and, and uh, who, who have, and, and, and are repeating them. I mean, you know, it's a part of, it's become part of the banterization, for want of a better word, of Hillsborough. They think it's acceptable. And, and they, I, I, I think a lot of them do believe it, you know, these, um, because, you know, there are ingrained, like historical, um, opinions of scouts and people from Liverpool, which are invariably negative, and they go back to the anti-Irishness, they go back to the famine. You can actually trace the changes if you read the newspapers and do the research in the in the 1850s, and you can see it develop. You can see a new narrative beginning. Liverpool is a rogue city with the citizens of, 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 of outsiders in the you know the socially, economically, and politically. And, you know, to an extent that was true. I mean, where I come from as an Irish nationalist MP until 1929, there is a basic instinct within particularly the English to despise scouts. They want to believe we did this and they they do believe they did this. We, we, we did these things and we're going to fight back and we're, we're going to try and make sure that the that narrative never overwhelms Hillsborough and that all decent, normal people will hear instead of the lies they will hear what actually happened that day and they'll get a sense of the gruesome injustice that follows the appalling injustice you know what the, the you know the the most witnessed tragedy in british history you know there the, were you know fifty thousand people in the grounds and yet the lies still perpetuate and i do believe people instinctively, deep down, want to believe this about us, and we're not having it. Richie, what was the personal effect of that day on you in the weeks, months and years after? Uh, I I think it's hard to say, isn't it? You kind of just carry on with your own life. Uh, I think it, I think it's probably easier for people around you to judge. Uh, I always remember going out for a drink about nine months after the, after it with a friend, and we were walking home, and he said, you, "You've got to speak to someone." And I was like, "Why?" And, and he said, "Like normally, you, you're all bubbly, and you don't stop talking when we go out for a drink." He said, "I've had to I've had to start every conversation tonight," and I think it's only looking back that you can see that you were in. I don't know whether you were still in shock nine months later. You've probably got post-traumatic stress, haven't you? But in them days, you, 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 like it wasn't the done things to go and get help, was it? And um, I, 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 I don't know. It, it has had a dramatic effect on everyone. I think that was there. You know, um, I, I know. I know lots of survivors, and I suppose we're all messed up to a certain degree. But mm. you, you, you've just got to carry on, haven't you? It's, it's one of them, you know. It's part of your life. I don't know. I don't know any other life. It, 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 I, I went to a football match and everything changed after, from that day on. Mm. And you must, um, in your work, then the years. I, it, it strikes us obviously how, how young so many of the um, those who, who died were. That their parents must be aging and even passing away now, Richie. And they've had this their whole lives and and maybe never saw the justice they were hoping for. And and you've probably seen that happen. I presume that that we're in that stage, are we? That's one of the real tragedies as well, apart from like survivors who've taken their own lives because they can't, you know, they haven't been able to live, you know, b- b- being taught as a murderer or someone that would rob from the dead or, you know, all these dreadful lies that, that like, the English press told about us and, the, the, you know, the South Yorkshire police told about us. Um, lots of family members have had their lives cut short 
because of the, st- the stress that they've been under, uh, you know, and, and having to continually fight and continually at brick walls uh, with every legal avenue they went down. And maybe this is something, you know, these trolls on social media should think of. Um, you know, they probably think it's something that happened years and years ago and they're not hurting anyone. But, the, you know, I, 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 like, look, I know loads of survivors who are on Twitter and Facebook and that. And there's loads of family members who've lost, you know, um, sons, daughters, you know, wives, everything. And they're, they're on there. They're reading all this nonsense that's thrown at us. Um, and, it, and it's dreadful. It, has, it does have a, you know, a real deep impact on everyone that was there and everyone that was involved. Mm. And, and as, as Tony says, you know, we're determined now, me and Tony are determined to carry on the education side of Hillsborough. I went to um, Utrecht in Holland um, in May and spoke at a university there um, as part of a linguistics course that they do. Uh, where, and they're looking at um, how the police compile the statements and things like that. And this is something me and Tony are hoping to kick on with from here. Um, you know, forget the trolls who, who, mm. who won't listen to what really happened. But we we will we will keep educating people and and we'll keep telling the truth. And Richie, and and only in so much detail as you're comfortable with. But I, I presume on that day, I don't know how close you were to serious injury or death. I certainly would know for a fact you saw things you never wanted to see and heard about things you never wanted to hear about. That you know, period nine months where you're out with your mate and you're quiet when. When does that fog lift, or do you do you know when it lifts? When does that what? Sorry, that fog that you're in begin to lift, and a certain I don't know. Maybe you're never carefree after something like that. Um, I think when I realised I'd been suffering was when you know that that truth day, right. um, and I think until then you just kind of carry on. Um, I mean, I was right in the middle. I was right in the middle of where mo- most of the deaths occurred. Um, a crash barrier collapsed right in front of us, you know. So, uh, and then we got out on the pitch and we were carrying. I saw, I saw a young lad die on the pitch in front of us, and we carried someone on adver- an advertising hose up the other end. But you, you kind of just you you can't change where you were that day or what happened to you. You just can't. It's just part of you. It just becomes part of you. Um, so I, I, I don't know. You, you, you kind of just get on with life. I don't, as I say, I don't know any difference. I, can, mm. I can't take myself out of that bubble. I'm probably still yeah. in it now. I mean, even now, family members say, you know, you, it's still not too late to go and speak to people. But I, I think you kind of find your own coping me- mechanisms. You know, and when the inquests were on, we were busy looking at police statements and passing the information we were finding on to like. Um, journalists and to the family's legal teams and things like that so uh, when I, I was just, I wasn't sleeping much I was on the computer and looking at all kinds of things and people are saying you, you can't carry on like this and I, and, and I suppose you can't but you, 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 you kind of do find your way of coping where if you feel it getting too much you walk away from it for a couple of days and then come back and start again but it's something that I, I could never let go of, you, uh, you know, as I say, the lies were so grotesque about us, I, I, I could never let it go. Yeah. Tony, I've obviously um, followed your writing down the years, so I know you were about 28 and you weren't in the pens, you were in the stand watching it. And uh, I even saw you say on Twitter recently, um, I don't know what the best way of putting it is, but like, can I class myself as a survivor or like a degree of imposter syndrome almost and and i don't know are you, are you, you're i hope you've come to terms with the fact and accepted now you were completely traumatized by the whole thing as much as anybody well yeah i mean it's you know it was Anne williams who uh who lost her son kevin who was 15 um who, who said to me i was a survivor i didn't see that i was just i was just there you know it didn't happen to me you know i'm not I never got it. I just come around the corner and saw a bunch of dead bodies so oh, what, why and you know it took me i think it took me probably a decade to realise that I'd had a nervous breakdown. It took me... I, I come out of the ground and when I couldn't do anything and the, uh, the lines of police were just standing there, no one was helping anyone, I sort of panicked and ran away. I didn't know what to do. And it took me probably 10, 15 years to stop running. You know, it's... Uh, it's, it's and, and the thing is, you, what, what impact does that on you? Well, you know, it's um, the nightmares, you know, the, the, and that your family suffer from that, you know, the, um, you know, so the flashbacks, you know, it's, um, and the sometimes erratic behaviour because, 
you know, we, we, you know, Rich, Richie was right in the middle of it, but, uh, you know, so even those who weren't there saw things that, you know, he, he saw more bodies than people generally do in peacetime. You know, you, you, you go to a football match and you expect to have fun, you're expecting to have a laugh, you're expecting to have a great time. You know, a few beers with your mates, sing, go home, and, you know, and it's like, and it's great. Instead, you see mass death. So it, it's it's one of those things where, and the, the one thing, the one thing that keeps me going, like I say, is I, I don't want anyone to experience anything similar. And yet we see the same patterns happening. You know, we've seen just today, we've seen the, uh, uh, you know, the, the Guardian's investigation to what happened in Paris at the Champions League final, which, you know, Liverpool fans had a lucky escape. But you know what? The first thing you get on Twitter, why is it always them? Even from Evertonians, even from fellow Scousers, why is it always them? Well, I'll tell you why. Because it's a big fan base and we, Liverpool, get to big games. But they shouldn't be asking, why is it always them? They should be asking, why is this happening in the first place? Because the way the French police acted at the Champions League final would have put Manchester United fans, certainly if they were there, in danger. It put Real Madrid fans in danger. This is not about us. This is about the way football fans are treated. This is about the way public events are policed and the way the safety of football fans is often downgraded and discarded. And, you know, as I say, any, the slightest thing that happens, the abuse starts again, which tells me that it's not just a bit of banter. There are deep, ingrained beliefs that somehow we are less than human and we would act in a way that other people wouldn't act. You know, and, and when is it the Hillsborough film? You know, it's a, 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 you know, a lot of people said it. I asked the question, would you do it? People would come up to me all the time and say to me, admit it, you were drunk and you broke the gates down, you pushed in. I'd say, would you do it? And they go, no, no. Why would anyone think that we did? But they do, they continue to think of it. And more and more people are thinking it. At least that's what the sense I get from the way crowds are acting in football grounds. I mean, we've heard Shrewsbury fans, you know, your traditional rivals, I kind of get they might do this, but Shrewsbury fans, Nottingham Forest fans, they were actually in the stadium and they saw it, they witnessed it, and yet they they, they were doing it all over the country. You get, you know, um, the sun was right, your murderers, people are saying this all the time. It's wider than just a few people and it's growing and it's growing and we need to stop it. I don't know how we're going to do it. The only way we can stop it is by fighting it with the truth. Tony, when you say you spent those initial few years afterwards uh, running away from it, what caused you to turn around and face it? Oh, I was just, I, I, I moved to uh, the United States and I was, uh, I was working in a job where uh, I, I was sort of writing about cars I was driving down the um, I was driving down the, the, the freeway. There was um, it was in the spring and Mount Baldy in California. There was snow on the top. It was a clear day. I was in um, a Mercedes 500 SL uh, convertible, and like I was driving down, I just thought, "What am I doing here? What am I doing here?" I you know it just struck me. I'm like I'm I'm running away. Um, I, I haven't faced you know because you know. Uh, I was in California, I was having a great life, but or appeared to be having a great life. I was miserable. I was having nightmares and flashbacks all the time. I was, what I thought, looking back, was me having a great time, was extremely self-destructive behaviour. And and I was like, I'd come back home and still running, still running a bit. You know, it wasn't until really... Um, until I, well, I became deputy football editor at the Times and you know, had a voice that I really had to confront the demons when I was writing about it. And, you know, and those years, between 2005 and 2009, the, the, the 20th anniversary, were very, very difficult years. No one was interested in it. No one seemed to be uh, to be advocating for our cause. Um, we were banging our heads against a brick wall, and that was really, in, in, you know, that was another very dispiriting period. But we come out of that, when we got to 2012 and I thought, mm. we're on the right track. It turns out that we weren't really. And that's the saddest thing. We have a, you know, and, and the, the, the lies still persist and the lies are lingering and we need to fight them everywhere we can. Yeah. 
listen to both of you, Richie, it's, it, I guess, a parallel universe. If this terrible thing had happened, but there had been no cover-up, you wonder how much less traumatic it would have have been for you and for everybody concerned. You, you, you both talk every bit as much about the the cover up and the fallout as the day itself. Yeah, and I think if people had held their hands up the next day and mm-hmm. said, you know, oh my God, you know, we made we made a terrible mistake and blah blah blah, and and, mm-hmm. and there'd been an investigation, like an in, a proper independent investigation into it, where they the highlighted, you know, the the failings of the ground because it was a death trap. Uh, and the police had held their hands up. Christ, the the the, the heartache and the, the deaths and everything that would have would have saved is immeasurable, you know. And not to say, and not even, you know, the money as well. I mean, it, it, to go to the, I think, uh, I think, for the police to lie again for twenty five months in Warrington, uh, it cost the taxpayer another ten million pounds, you know. So. This is what I think. This is why, you know, people are fighting for the Hillsborough Law, which will compel public officials into telling the truth, because that was one of the reasons why the uh, criminal trials ended in such a farce was because the statements amendments that the police made, um, then they, they for for an inquest they don't have to turn up and tell the truth. Mm. You know that 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 sounds absolutely ridiculous, doesn't it? And it is. But that, but that, you know, that's where we are. Yeah. Uh, and and are, is your sense, Rishi? Are we are we pretty much done now in terms of official action? It's about the education Tony talked about for sure going forward. But in terms of, you know, we've charted the last decade where quite a lot happened officially. I, do you think that's done? Yeah. Listen, no one will ever be able to take away, uh, you know, the results of the Hills, Hillsborough Independent Panel. And the longest running inquests in British history, the jury returned a 14 nil verdict in our favour. Question six was uh, about how the people died and they returned an unlawful killing verdict. Question seven said, did the fans have any part to play in causing the, the deaths? And the jury, after listening to hundreds of witnesses for 25 months, said no the fans played no part and then there was a, a little tag on question to uh question seven may the supporters have contributed to the deaths and and we we hated the fact that that question was in when at the inquest because we thought well the jury can't help but trip up on that one yeah. but again they answered no they you know they were satisfied after hearing all that evidence that the fans weren't to blame um you know, that should be enough for people, surely. But you know, as I say, we are where we are again. Yeah. Uh, but I guess no, me, nothing, me, nothing will be enough in some respects, I suppose. No, no, you can never you can never satisfy everyone, can you? But as you say, me and Tony will, will, will keep fighting the fight. Yeah. Uh, Tony, uh, like, we, doing interviews like this, I don't take it for granted that you and Richie have come on and just talked for the last... Uh, 40 plus minutes uh, and you know down the years reading your pieces like they burn with anger and I, I suspect you have to go to an emotional place to produce those pieces and to talk the way you do uh, does it, does all of this take a toll when you're doing all these interviews and revisiting it? Yeah, a, a friend of ours who was uh, you know doing one of these described doing one of these interviews he said every time you do it a little piece of yourself falls off every time you talk about it a little, a little something in you flakes away and disappears. Now I can understand that. I can understand that. It, it, it is exhausting emotionally, and you know we shouldn't be here. We shouldn't be in this situation. We shouldn't be saying no. You know what? That any chance of restitution is gone. We shouldn't be saying that. But it's important, as I say, we owe it not just to the dead. We owe it to the living, and we owe it to the people of the future who might be put in situations like this. You know, I remember, I think it was uh, Manchester United were playing in France um, a year ago in the Champions League. I think it was Lille, and they, uh, or Lyon, I forget which one it was. And the fans were in the crush at half time. And you know what? I felt so sick. I felt so ill. And, like, I was crying for hours at the thought that they might have to go through that. And, you know, I was brought up to despise Manchester United. But, you, you know, this is not about football. This is about humanity. And, you know, you you, 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 you hear, I say, I, I was really, to say, 
the impact of seeing what happened at the Manchester Arena bombings had a, a, a you know a detrimental effect on me is an understatement. Right. To see people still dying for the same reasons when we should have learned from it, and this as this is the most important thing to me to going forward. It's it's you know. We're, we're not going to get any satisfaction out of it. All we can do is leave a, le leave a legacy, and the legacy of Hillsborough shouldn't be a negative one, and that's what we're going to fight to do. OK, very good. Well, listen, Tony Evans of The Independent. Uh, we'll speak again, I'm sure, uh, across the months about happier topics. Thanks for your time, though. And Richie Greaves, who uh, worked for the Hillsborough Survivors Association. Uh, Richie, pleasure to talk to you. Thank you very much for coming on the show. We appreciate it. You're welcome, Joe. Thanks for inviting us.